Hey there, welcome to Sauce and Bound Podcast. I'm your host and the Dana Hado Girls at Sauce Group, a serial acquirer buying wonderful businesses to take them to the next level. And here I chat with inspiring founders and experts to get an inside scoop on how they made their business success. And today with me is Frank, CEO and founder of Nextcloud, the most popular on premises content collaboration platform that you can download. That's a great promise. Welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. I was going around uh, uh, the website and I was looking at your customers and I was like, okay, that, that's interesting. Something <laughs> we should definitely discuss and we'll get there. Uh, but first of all, I would like to get a bit of an in on your personal story. So who's Frank and how did you come to build Nextcloud in the first place? <laughs> that's a good question. Um... So I'm a software developer by training, um, studied computer science and uh, my whole life I always was fascinated with software because um, you can build something, you can build a product, you can do something. And if you, if you're like, I don't know, if you're interested in ships or cars or whatever, you cannot really do this alone, but software, you can really just sit down and like create and develop a great product, create great software that always fascinated me and all the the creativity that's possible, all the, the, the good things you can do. So there's always something that was really yeah, interesting for me. This is why I focused on computer science since the very beginning. Um, for quite some time, I was an um, employee. I was like working for different uh, tech companies and some management positions, usually around like engineering or um, unit management, something like that. But um, three years ago, Quite some years now ago, I founded my my own company, um, the, which was like yeah a little bit successful. <laughs> Second one uh, did a little bit better, but uh, still not really as it should be. And with Nextcloud, I'm really happy that um, that it works now uh, quite well now. Um, and yeah, really what I what I said at the beginning, what fascinates me to build like interesting, great, creative uh, products, and that's what we. That's what we do at, at Nextcloud. So um, becoming a founder was somehow by accident. It was never really my goal to be a founder or it was never the goal to be the CEO. Um, the, the motivation was that I had lots of ideas, lots of things I, I wanted to do. And of course, if you have your own company, you can uh, build what you want. <laughs> and if the customers like it, that's good. And if not, they're not. So you basically we have quite some influence and some, some power to to build interesting products and yeah that's that's what motivated me and that's what we're doing at the moment okay that makes sense why why open source and why content collaboration of of anything mm -hmm. else out there yeah so open source is something that fascinated me for forever like basically since the whole free software open source movement started like 25 years ago uh, uh, 30 years ago is it's basically, and it means a lot of different things, <clears throat> but what fascinated me most is the community aspect that people from all over the world, um, coming together and building something really cool in a, in a collaborative way over the internet, uh, also as volunteers often that you just do this as for fun. It's not your job. It can be your job, but you can also do it for fun. And this fascinated me with the Linux movement, the KDE desktop, lots of other projects. And uh, yeah, this is also the way we develop Nextcloud. So we as Nextcloud actually, we are a company with like 120 people at the moment, but we have several thousand volunteers. And we have lots of, lots of volunteers and they come together to build Nextcloud. And that's really the power of open source. So that's always uh, fascinating me. And of course, from a user perspective, from a customer's perspective, it also means that you're in control, that you can see what's going on. You can basically look inside to see how it works and it gives you more security and, and safety and more control over your, your product. So open source is a big win for everybody, in my opinion. Yeah, and uh, collaboration software, connect collaboration software, it's also another thing that fascinates me because it means that it is software for people that's actually used by people. It's not something like super technical somewhere in the database or backend, I don't know, but it's really something that is, um, yeah, useful, used by lots of people every day. And you can really, um, develop lots of innovative things. You can be creative. I mean, at the moment we're doing a lot of features improvement in the area of AI, for example, and we can just like 
yeah, build something that uh, improves the life of our our users. So this is why it's fascinating to me. Okay, you're talking a lot about fascination, and I feel like there's a lot of curiosity <laughs> also still uh, in what you were doing. Were you always like this? Yep. Like when when did you start coding, and like what was the first project that you did, if you remember? <laughs> Uh, actually, I don't, I'm not really sure. I must be, when I, mean, I was 10 or 11, or maybe 12, 12 years old. I'm not fully, really, fully sure, but I coded like just a little bit of experimented with a programmable pocket calculator in basic. Uh, so very, very weird, very nerdy. Um, yeah. And then later with all the, the, the more modern technologies, obviously. But, um, yeah, as I said at the beginning, it really fascinated me because you can build things. I think the first application I wrote when I was so young was like a, just a, like a, um, like a small application where you can train your, um, some math. Basically, you can, if you want to train your, your math skills, you can, you could use that. And I, I think I never really used it myself, but it was just fascinating that you can, can do this alone. Yeah. yeah that, that's a lot of fun. So you, you used your nerdy skills to build something quite nerdy. <laughs> that's <laughs> That's interesting. Indeed. Yeah. All right. Well, how did Nextcloud started shaping into what it is right now? At what point did you mm. realize that this kind of side project where there are volunteers and people can pitch in could become a business? I mean, this is there is not one moment in time when things change. It's a long journey. I think every founder can uh, can say that that it's a, a longer journey. With lots of ups and downs, you need lots of uh, energy, lots of dedication. Uh, in our case, uh, Nextcloud is eight years old now. Um, it started as a as a fork of my previous company, my previous um, project. Uh, we started with twelve people, um, and um, yeah, had nothing, <laughs> no product, no customers, no brand, uh, no no income, uh, nothing. Um, so the first few months were quite uh, quite hard, obviously, because you need, need to bootstrap everything, and uh, there's of course the chicken egg problem there, uh, where to start, because all those things depend on each other. Um, but we were quite lucky that relatively quickly we got the significant uh, big customer. Um, basically, after a few months, um, this already gave us some stable income um and someone to work with and um yeah then all started to to move forward and then we are we grew to 20 30 50 people we grew from like 1 million arr to 2 5 10 um last year we did uh, 18 and this year the goal is and we're on track of uh, 35 uh, million arr and um, i'm skipping over <laughs> lots of challenges and problems over the years, um, but that's just how it is. I mean, you as a founder, you really need to, you need to have a lot of dedication. You need to like what you do because it is, it is not easy. It's a constant, constant fight with, uh, okay. yeah, challenges. Okay. And it must have been a, like quite a bit of a change for you because like you said, you're, you're a trained developer and maybe, and now correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's, uh, it might be the most fascinating and the, the the thing that you love the most uh but with the transition from 12 people into working with customers and into building it into a real company uh your role must have changed as well did you find something that yep. you love now as much as you love coding or is it still going back to code is <laughs> something you're, mm -hmm. you're dreaming of every day well the times where did code is, is long gone. I mean, uh, a lot of things happened <laughs> between when I was 10 years old to now, right? I mean, uh, as I said before, I worked in management of IT companies uh, before, um, where I really, yeah, got used to work with customers and yeah, work with people basically. So this is not something that happened like lately. It's my whole, whole career. Um, yeah, my, my, my role definitely is changing. It's changing all the time. Um, it's um, a lot more strategic decisions. 
it's not really not no, no longer so many uh, day to day decisions. It's more strategic. But okay, what should we do that basically moves us forward in a significant way next year? For example, product decisions, hiring decisions, uh, positioning, marketing, sales strategies, and so on. Lots of strategic decisions nowadays. Then there, are, of course. Um, other things that I, I basically need to do nowadays, um, which were a little bit um, unexpected. For example, I'm involved in politics a lot nowadays um, because the way we position Nextcloud is that it's a great solution for our governments to give you digital sovereignty, control over your data. Um, and that's a sensitive topic in politics. So I'm actually yeah, talking with a lot of politicians, Germany, France, Sweden, uh, Austria, where we have lots of customers, but also I'm often in the in Brussels and working with politicians there, with the Commission or at the Parliament. So this is something that is a little bit unexpected, but it uh, has something to do with our with our business and how we position next cloud. Absolutely. So you already mentioned that uh, you carved out that part. Uh, from uh, from your previous business, and I know there was a bit of a hiccup with uh, with the management and with the team culture that you didn't quite enjoy. How did you mm. change in Nextcloud? What did you fundamentally change to now be happy with the culture you're cultivating and with the team that you're going? So the biggest the biggest change is probably that um, we no longer have investors. So we have no investors next to load. Next load is completely bootstrapped. Um, this might sound a bit surprising to some other founders because I know a lot of founders are running around and are looking for investment. Um, I would advise everybody to just be completely clear with everybody what you get into um, because um, investment is not free money. It means that you have uh, suddenly a boss, you suddenly have someone who tells you what to do, which is an often case, don't get me wrong, in, in a lot of cases it's great, right? It's basically uh, someone who gives you tips, someone who is mentoring you, uh, but it also means that you have to do what is in the interest of your investors. Um, and um, some of the interest might align with your interests and your goals and some other things not. So, um, and in the case of the former company, it was not well aligned, which forced us to do things that, to do things that didn't make sense. Um, and they were not good for the company. Um, and now we are completely independent and uh, big decisions is something we can just discuss internally with everybody. We can, um, look into the pros and cons, and then we can decide, um, decide what's the best path forward and this works a lot better i have to say so i think our strategic decisions are really a lot better now because we are independent and we can really do what's in the interest of everybody and not only the the big uh, vcs um yeah and this led to um i think this is the big the, the big point the big answer to your question but it also leads to a lot of other decisions regarding culture for example we have uh, um, one of our goals is to uh, an inclusive and a diverse organization. Actually, the 120 people that we that we have at the moment, they are based in 23 countries, so it's really from all over the world. Um, and we really try to have a diverse team in other areas and in other ways too, regarding um, men, women, uh, religion, skin color, and so on, everything. And this actually works well and gives us a very very nice. Um, culture, work culture, and, and team spirit, and everything internally. Um, the remote work already mentioned is also another thing that we that we decided to do strategically. This works well. Um, yeah, just the way we do decisions, the way we communicate, that we're completely transparent and open internally, and so on. So um, yeah, we actually improved a lot in the culture area over the previous company and. Yeah, and this is not only just for fun or because it's ethical, it also makes us a, a better organization, in my opinion. All right. I think in one of your podcasts, you said um, in order uh, to have the right people, you have to um, have the right mindset. So what is the mindset you're talking about? Um, 
what what is your mindset for for growing the company and who what kind of mindset should people have uh to be hired in next cloud that's a big question um <laughs> an important thing is trust so we need to trust each other um and this is of course easy to say <laughs> Every company probably says, yeah, of course we trust each other. But the whole discussion around, around a remote work and if people should come to the office or more often or not, this actually shows that a lot of managers don't really trust their people too much because they think, well, if they work from somewhere, I don't know what they're doing. Uh, I don't know if they're really working or not working. Um, but if they come to the office, I can check if they're working nine to five. So this actually shows a lack of trust in your colleagues. And uh, I think trusting each other is a very important thing. And if you do, if you're fully remote and you have people in different um, time zones, um, then of course you need to trust each other. And if you do that, you actually have great results because you then do, don't do like weird micromanagement or other, other things that are not, not nonsensical but you really work on the, on the results. So that's an important thing. So and then you also ask what's important uh, to become part of the team. One thing that's really important is that people are, they like what they do. It sounds a bit weird, but um, I think we only hire people in all areas who like what they do because then they're also usually good with it. And also they are like motivated to do a good job there. Um, that's something that's that's very important and also people who like to grow and to learn because if you learned something in in, in college um, that's great but if you work in tech then i can guarantee you that you need to do different things in a few years later so the world is always changing moving forward so for me it's also less important what people learned 20 years ago it's more important that they're eager to move forward and they're constantly exploring new things. Um, and then, yeah, then you can also be innovative and uh, then you're ready for the future. Absolutely. Are you still actively involved in recruiting or, or maybe it is just for more senior roles? How does it work? Yeah, this is a bit weird actually, um, because I'm actually very involved in recruiting. Um, in fact, I'm doing um, together with our head of HR, I do all the all the, um, the the first interviews with all the new candidates, and that actually um, uses a lot of my time. And uh, sooner or later, it needs to change, of course, because it's no longer doable for me. But uh, today, I'm, I'm I'm still doing that because it is like super important. It's the most important thing to have the best possible team, and um, yeah. I'm deeply involved there. Okay. All right. Well, uh, you said you're, you're fully bootstrapped and obviously, uh, with, the being open source, you have contributors who can, well, almost act as part of the team. Uh, if, uh, mm -hmm. you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, do you think that open source projects maybe have a better chance of survival per se, because they have this team that helps them with development. And uh, sometimes also uh, open source projects are for developers as well. So they have a bit of an advantage also of a community. So almost like they're first in to the market. Yeah, there's some, um, indeed, there's some um, strategic advantages of an open source community, of an open source product. Um, of course, what you said, right? And you have, if you do it right, you have people helping you to develop it. But there are also lots of other factors that are also super important. For example, um, it gives you a, like a direct feedback channel if what you're doing is actually useful and in which direction it should go. I um, sometimes I see startups who like plan and manage their product completely inside their own uh, meeting room. Um, and they do lots of discussions and thoughts and develop something. And then, I don't know, after the first uh, the version 1.0 is done, then they release it to the world. And then they're surprised that it is not, that there's not a great product market fit. 
And uh, if you're completely open and transparent and work together with your users, work together with your community, then you always have this direct feedback channel that what you're doing is actually the right thing, what they expect. And if you forget something, like an important feature, that someone else in the community is, is developing it. So it basically makes sure that you have a great product market fit. Um, and also helps you a ton in marketing and brand building and awareness building. Because if you're a small organization, you don't really have a marketing budget to um, promote your brand in a big way, right? You cannot really, I don't know, <laughs> do a big campaign, but if you have users, if you have fans, if you have ambassadors that are already using and liking your product and running around and re recommending it to others, then this is a huge marketing channel and also helps with sales. Um, there, so it actually has a lot of strategic benefits to do open source. Okay, you mentioned that it took you uh, a couple of months to to get your first customer. How did your first customer find you, or how did you find them? Um, they actually found us. Um, in fact, um, all our customers find us. <laughs> so all our uh, sales is uh, inbound. So we never, never did a single outreach to someone. We never did a cold call or anything um, so far. They all come to us. Um, and this is because of what I said earlier, it's exactly the community. They're, they're looking on the internet, uh, asking people what is a good product, what to use. And then they hear about Nextcloud and then they come to us and say, hey, Nextcloud is great and you want to buy it. It's exactly because of the community. Do you still compete with the, the first company that uh, that you launched? Yeah, there is a bit of a thing going on because originally they they disappeared, they went uh, bankrupt. Um, that's also the main reason why the core team, including me, left. But then the the trademark and the contracts were bought by a new um, investor some years ago, and they tried for a while to compete with us. But um, yeah, they are in the process of disappearing. So this is, okay. uh, yeah, this is, there are so many strategic problems there. As I said, also the, the reason why I left and other people left and then most of the community switched to, to us. There are so many problems there, which made it not a, not a working business. Interesting. All right, let's talk about your customers. So you, you work yes. with governments and you work with hospitals and schools, universities. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, very big names and opinions out there. Uh, how do you balance uh, their needs and your consumer needs? And then um, how much of the development and the feature prioritization is your long term vision? And how much of it is, you know, your customers and your users just telling you, hey, we want all the bells and whistles out there? Very good question. Um, so first of all, as a product company, you need to be in control of your product uh, strategically. So you as a company, you need to have a vision, you have, have, you need to have a roadmap, you need to know where you want to go. Obviously, you need to listen to your customers, but it doesn't mean that you should do everything they want. Um, actually, in fact, next that would look very weird today if we would just blindly implement everything our customer tells us to do. Um, you need to listen to them and you need to prioritize their wishes um, with all the other um, yeah, requests. So the way we do that is that we have uh, regular planning meetings internally um, with uh, with the core um, with the core team, the developers of the individual component, um, some UI UX people, marketing people, sales people, and so on. Um, we have these meetings, and everybody brings their request to the table that um, someone says from engineers like, hey, this software really, this is bad quality. We need to rewrite this component or we need to do this and this to improve security. And then someone from sales said, yeah, we have this and this request from these customers. And if we implement this feature, we could really win this huge deal. Um, and then someone from marketing says, okay, um, um, we really need some really cool headline feature for the next announcement. Is there something cool we can do? 
there's someone like, hey, we really wanted to go into the whatever healthcare market, or we really want to go into, I don't know, the market in Japan or Brazil or something. For that, we need to have this and this functionality. Um, and then someone from a, from a big picture, um, for example, me says, okay, but I see the market going in this direction. We should really go in this direction too. And then, yeah, we, then we have so many requests on the table, um, 10 times more than what we can do. And then we balance it and then we do a little bit in all areas. Um, and yeah, that's how it works. So the answer to the question is we need to balance the different interests and it's not never possible to do, to make everybody fully happy. Um, because there's just too many things, but yeah, listen to everything. Okay. So it, because when I, uh, saw the, the list of all the governments that are using xCloud, it was like, okay, so if, you know, France requests that and Germany requests that, it's kind of like you have a whole Eurovision competition going on there. Like how, <laughs> how do you, how do you prioritize who wins? Uh, whose voice is the loudest voice in, you know, determining the features that are being built? I mean, from the sales perspective, of course, we should listen to the, to the customer. So it's the biggest budget, um, that is a factor, but there's also a factor, the factor if a feature works for other people too. So for example, if someone requests a feature that is very specific, which might make this one customer very happy and the rest of the world doesn't care, then this is probably low on the list. But if someone requests something that is quite useful and moves everybody forward, um, then this is a bit higher on the list. Um, and there's the complexity, of course, or how much work is it to do? How does it impact the user experience? I mean, for example, if someone requests a feature that requires us to put like 20 new blinking buttons on the user interface, then this is nothing we like because it software should be usable and simple, then this is a bit of a negative. So there's a balance of different factors happening there. Okay. And uh, I would also love to ask you about, you know, the bootstrapping journey because you've been growing for for a while and uh, I think I listened to the last year's episode and uh, you said there were 90 people and this year it's uh, 120 so the team is growing uh, I guess it's kind of the the biggest expense just as uh, in any other company um, yeah. how do you uh, how do you balance your pretty rapid growth with bootstrapping is there any tip Trick, uh, I don't know, um, when to hire, like having a certain amount of revenue uh, to hire or a, having a certain amount of runway to pay to that new person uh, if you're mm. hiring them. Is there anything you're using? When to hire? That's a good question. I mean, as a CEO, um, of course, you one of your main jobs is, of course, to balance risk, right? So you basically how fast, how fast you spend the resources you have and how long your, um, yeah, your runway should be, right? So if you think about possible, um, problems, so if you think, Hmm, what happens if out of coincidence, the biggest three customers all uh, run away tomorrow? What happens then, right? How does the cash flow situation look like? And this is a, this is a balancing act. I mean, this is something that every CEO needs to do. And, um, also people do it differently. Some people prioritize stability a little bit more. Some other people prioritize growth. And that's, that's something every CEO needs to decide on, on themselves and how they do that. One thing I, I want to say is that, um, it is really, really, really important to hire the right people. Hiring the right people is more important than hiring fast, in my opinion. As I said earlier, it's, this is also why I'm deeply involved in the hiring process from the beginning, because, um, it just influences your company and just, yeah, the people you hire today influence how you're doing next year. So, um, it's, 
for me a problem also if you have like uh, big investors is that they are um, well give you lots of money but they also want you to spend it like very fast and they don't give you money to put it on the bank they want you to spend it fast and spending fast means like hiring lots of people fast and um, i just saw a lot of companies basically hiring the wrong people because there was no real time to look for the right people um and then yeah and then you suddenly have a dysfunctional organization so i really would advise everybody to just make sure that the company culture and the, the processes and how everybody works together that's the most important thing you you have and just hiring quickly someone who looks good on paper but then is really toxic for the for the way you work together it can be one of your biggest mistakes okay thank you all right well you are all about open source and decentralized internet how did you feel about the whole ai coming public mm -hmm. i mean it's it's been out there for for a while right it's just it just became very popular last year um yeah how did you feel it's going to change the whole environment for for developers and tech and uh, how you how are you working with it now <laughs> i um i regularly give talks about exactly that topic and i usually describe it that when yeah dali came out and chat gpt one and a half years ago i usually describe it that i got a little bit of a depression because i thought okay shit, so we as small companies can no longer compete so this is a new thing that requires huge amount of resources like people but also like um, cloud computing resources to do that and I really thought, okay, wow, um, we are out of the game now. Small company uh, startups no longer have a, a real way to do the same that Google or Microsoft is doing. And the second thing for this uh, um, <laughs> accelerated uh, depression uh, I got <laughs> was that the whole ethical part. Because as, as you mentioned, it's uh, very important for Nextcloud and for me to build like an ethical product. We are all about giving people control, privacy, security. We want to um, decentralize the internet and so on. And then suddenly you have a technology which is very centralized and you have the whole problem around the trading data that these large language models are built with trading data that you don't know. So this is just some content from the internet and this is shuffled into this large language model models and uh, you don't really know what's going on and it all leads to uh, discrimination i mean if you ask some of this uh, chatbots hey can you i don't know describe a doctor then the, the chatbot probably describes a white man um, so it's not very diverse and it also does hallucination as we all know and this all basically comes with ethical challenges and i really thought oh shit, um do we actually do we really want to do that invest in this weird technology which has all these problems and even, even if you want to can be can be, as a small company can we compete with the with the with open ai microsoft google and so on and um yeah but what we did is we developed um, an, an ethical system it's called ethical ai and we have a rating system that we use to judge everything we are doing and everything we integrating with and this is like a transparent to all our users so they know what is happening and which features they activate and features they maybe should not activate. But it's super transparent. And the second thing is we build up our own AI team and we actually developed our own AI systems that can um, answer emails for you, or summarize email threads, uh, translate uh, documents, um, generate pictures, um, suggest um, responses to chat messages, summarizing chat uh, rooms and so on and so on. There are lots of innovative, cool features we are able to develop, and we have this now. The difference with our system is, of course, that everything is open source, everything is self hosted, everything is on premise, all the training data are, are transparent. Um, so um, we are doing all these features in a more ethical way than these big tech companies. And yeah, I always then conclude my, 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 my presentation that uh, my uh, uh, depression is gone because we actually found good answers to these challenges.
But yeah, okay. it's really uh, it's a big it's a big change in the industry, and you really have to think hard what to do and what not to do. Yeah. All right. So now the AI part is also integrated in the next cloud. So governments are yes. using AI, just a more Correct. ethical version of Correct. it. Correct. Yes, for example, we are developing um, um, special large language models together with the government at the moment. There's one state in Germany that provides us uh, training data of like um, government documents, for example, and we are building a large language model together with them. So we're very soon will be the, the very first um, <clears throat> organization who has a, an AI um, assistant inside a software like Nextcloud which is using their own data and but it's fully open source, self-hosted and transparent and um, has uh, no discrimination because the training data is checked. Okay. All right. Thank, thanks for walking me through this. And uh, well, uh, you know, this podcast is usually with SaaS founders and you guys are not SaaS. I just, I was just fascinated by the story and couldn't let it go. Uh, <laughs> but what is your, uh, what is your business model? Like how, how can a, a hospital here in Vietnam where I'm based um, use you guys? Yeah. So big question again. <laughs> so um, I think if you found a company, and then you need to think really hard about your positioning, your differentiation. Um, in our case, we are a collaboration suite. We have all these features, file syncing, chat, video conferencing, office document editing, mail, calendar, contacts, notes, and so on. Very similar to Microsoft, Google, and others. But our differentiator is that we are, that it can run, run on premise. So you can really host it yourself or you can host it at a, at a cloud provider you choose and you trust. That basically gives you more control over your your data and your your communication. So that's our that's our differentiator. Um, and this is why we are not we are why we, this is why we are not SaaS. So um, everybody has their own differentiator. You can do a SaaS business obviously, but then you are, again you need to find something that differentiates you to the existing uh, companies and, and products. So this is why we are um, not SaaS with our differentiator. Um, as I said, you can host it yourself or you just go to a local uh, provider. So if you're, to answer your question, uh, if you're a hospital in Vietnam or somewhere else, you can decide to host it yourself. Not a lot of people want to do it. Um, some governments do because if it's really super critical, but like normal companies usually don't really host it themselves. Um, but um, you can go to a local service provider. So there are actually hundreds of companies who offer a hosted version of Nextcloud. Um, there are several in Vietnam, actually. Um, I, I know that I was in Vietnam lately and, and talked with some of them. Um, so yeah, you can go to a local company and say, hey, I want to have a hosted Nextcloud and you get it from them. Okay, all right, thank you. So uh, just a couple more questions. Um, something that's super usual here uh, on the podcast. Over the eight years of building Nextcloud, uh, what has been your biggest win and your biggest failure? Ooh, <laughs> big question. You mean strategically or decision-making or it can be anything. customer? Like, something that's stuck yeah. with you. It could be even like your personal mistake. like hiring yeah. the wrong person that just, you know, you kind of let go or <laughs> hiring the best person out there, you know, give them a shout out. <laughs> yeah, I hired some very good and some not so good people. <laughs> that was not just normal, I think. I But to answer this more interestingly, I think the biggest win was really the bet on remote work, I have to say. Um, the, a lot of organizations see this as something that is um, a potential problem that you, in the best case, somehow mitigate. But for us, it is really the opposite. It's a strategic plus. So we're just having so awesome people in Nextcloud that we could not hire if everybody would be somehow local. Not, not maybe in the same office, but even in the same city or the same country or just Europe. I mean, the fact that we are hiring all over the world is really helping us 
so much to have the best possible team. So this, I would say this is the biggest, the biggest win, biggest problem. Um, challenge, not a mistake. Or challenge, yeah. I think I underestimated the, the importance to do networking in politics. I would say, I, I think a few years ago, I was a little bit naive and I thought, okay, if you're just building a, building a great product and you do great marketing around it, then everybody will see it and use it and love it. And, um, this is of course true to some extent, but if you work lots with governments, and as you mentioned, we work with the German government, French government, European commission, Sweden. Spain, um, lots of other places. If you work with governments, it is actually not so important to have the best product. It's important to know the right people. Um, which is, um, yeah, I didn't expect that a few years ago. So nowadays I really travel a lot. I speak with a lot of people and have a personal network. Um, and this really helps a lot. And this is needed additionally to having a great product. Okay. So it's, I think when, when you were selling to well, enterprise customers and the, the bigger the tickets, the, the, the more relationships you should have, uh, with the, with the decision makers. So I guess when you were selling to governments, there is no way around it. Uh, but, uh, thanks for mentioning it. And the last question is always about a hack. Is there any hack that helps you in any way? Something, you know, could be completely unconventional. Uh, and it can be again, related to anything, you know, hiring, growth, anything. Yeah. I think, uh, I don't know if I would call it a hack, but the thing that is quite unusual and works, uh, really good at Nextcloud is, uh, our lead generation, uh, our growth process. Um, I think you also specialized on growth, right? So maybe this yeah. is an interesting study for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we get around between 200 and 300 new contacts every day. And after a sophisticated qualification process, um, we generate, uh, marketing qualified leads around 20 per day. So 20 good new leads, um, every single day that we pass on to a sales who then calls the people and talks with them. And this number is really, really high. This is a number which is a lot higher than what you expect from a company our our size. Um, and, and the reason for that is really our open source strategy that we have um, that we give away the product for free. So in a way, it is you could think it's a little bit like a premium model on steroids, um, but we really, really give it away for free, not in a limited way. You can really do everything with it. And this means that we are so well known and it means we have so many fans all over the world. And then we just get, I don't know, we get like great leads from, I don't know, Vietnam, for example. And we never did any marketing in Vietnam. We don't have a person there. We don't have any, we have no lead in ads or no, no events, no classic marketing activities at all, but we get leads from there. And this has something to do with our, our um, community and open source strategy. And I, yeah, maybe you could call this a growth hack in that way. Okay. So more, more companies should, should go open source. It was actually funny. Uh, when I was researching about Nextcloud, one of the things I found when I Googled you was actually, um, an article on Wikipedia in Vietnamese about Nextcloud. Oh, really? So, <laughs> I yeah. didn't know that. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> really? There, wow. so. That's how people know about you. Uh, but, uh, yeah, well, thanks so much for, for telling me about the hack. I mean, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not the most obvious one, but definitely works for you. So thank you so much mm -hmm. for, for walking me through the, the story. I, I think it's a great one. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, ho I hope this will be valuable for whoever listens to this episode. Thank you so much, Frank, for your time. Thanks for having me. Anytime and take care.